us to this book of on, on the making of an economic superpower on China's rapid industrialization. Uh, my name is Xiaoli Wang. I'm the facilitator of this book talk. And today we are very happy to have uh, prof uh, Professor Tom Pendel Wang of our university and the speaker come all the way from the United States, uh, Dr. Wen Yi. And Professor Wang, he joined our university in 2007 uh, in the Department of Economics. And Dr. Wen actually is not new to USC. And Professor Wang will be our moderator. I'll let Professor Wang to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Uh, I'm Hong Pei Wang, and uh, it's our great honor to uh, invite uh, Professor uh, Wang Yi um, to give us uh, this book talk on the uh, making of economic superpower. Um, so, Professor uh, uh, Wang uh, is currently a distinguished visiting professor at Tsinghua University. Uh, he was uh, he is also the assistant vice president uh, of uh, uh, the St. Louis uh, Federal Reserve Bank. Um, before that, uh, he uh, he was uh, he has teaching has been uh, ha I was teaching at uh, Tsinghua University. Uh, it's the one thousand talent uh, uh, program, and uh, he was uh, a professor at Cornell University. And actually, Professor Wing started his career at uh, at KUSD. Uh, was a senior professor. Uh, here from 19, uh, 1907 to 1999. Um, so Professor Wen was uh, a leading uh, 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 expert uh, in uh, asset price bubble, uh, super fulfilling uh, financial, uh, super fulfilling and uh, belief driving business cycle uh, studies. Uh, his uh, article has uh, published in uh, the most prestigious, some of the most prestigious uh, journals like Econometrica, uh, Economic Studies, uh, Journal of Monetary Economics, and uh, uh, American uh, Journal of Macroeconomics, and, and among many other journals. So without further ado, so I, I, I let's uh, uh, give uh, Professor Wing a warm uh, uh, welcome. So, so yeah. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, the Hong Kong USD Library for such a wonderful opportunity. And thank Hong Bei for the wonderful introduction. So because of uh, the limited time and I have a lot of materials to cover, I will speak very fast, pushing through uh, the slides. But later on, so I can have some time for you to ask questions. And uh, just in case you're more comfortable for reading Chinese, uh, there's a Chinese screen there. Unfortunately, it's a simplified Chinese. Uh, not uh, not the traditional Chinese. Okay, so as you can see, the title uh, of the talk is about uh, China. And before I start, this is a policy required by Federal Reserve Bank. There's a disclaimer here. Uh, <laughs> so basically, uh, the rise of China now is very well known. It's one of the I think it's one of the most important in, uh, events in modern human history uh, since the British Industrial Revolution which is started about 250 years ago. Uh, the reason is very simple. Okay, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, um, uh, trying try to glorify this event. Because uh, despite more than 200 years of industrialization uh, started by the, by the British, so far we have had only about 10% of the world's population living in fully industrialized society. And uh, if China can manage to finish its industrialization, there will be additional 20% of world's population entering modern industrial civilization. <coughs> and furthermore, China's rise is igniting new growth across the entire world, many continents, including Asia, Latin America, Africa, and even the industrial West, heavily influenced. And with forces 20 times that of the rising US in the late 19th century, and 100 times that of the rising England in the late 18th and early 19th century. 
So that force is very powerful, very strong. Let's clear some uh, basic facts you all know very well. 35 years ago, or roughly 40 years ago now, uh, in terms of per capita income, China was very poor. The level is about one third <laughs> of that of South Central Africa. Okay. But today, China has changed dramatically. Even though it has not become a high income country, China is the world's largest manufacturing powerhouse, able to produce crude steel 800 times the level of US, cement, one of the most basic industrial materials, 60% of world capacity, vehicles, about a quarter of global production, and industrial patent applications with lumber bigger than the sum of the US and Japan combined in just a one generation time. And also China is the world's largest producer of many other things, such as ships, high-speed trains, household appliances, tunnels, bridges, highways, chemical fibers, machine tools, computers, cell phones, etc. So in one word, with only 6% of, uh, of, of global water resources and 9% of arable land, of global uh, uh, arable land resources, China is able to produce about one-third of major agricultural goods in the world and about half of uh, major industrial goods. So here's a graph about China's manufacturing output. Starting around the 70s, China was at the bottom. Okay, this is the, 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 the vertical axis is too condensed, you cannot even see. And after just one generation, now China surpassed right to the top. Okay, surpassed all the industrial ship, uh, superpowers. And overtook the US around the 2010 in terms of manufacturing output. And in terms of uh, patent application, the same dramatic picture is shown here, and the channel rose from the bottom, surpassed all the superpowers now at the top, with number of applicants, uh, applications larger than the US and Japan combined. So what are the explanations? China's rapid rise is based on, we all know, a kind of peculiar or unique political system. Okay, a lot of people criticize that. And that effect has positive the entire world. So many people, including many Chinese themselves, are still thinking that this process is not sustainable. There are many theories, of course, proposed to explain China's rise. But among the many conflicting views, I want to point out two, the polar views, okay, and many of them are just different. The first view sees China's hypergrowth as a gigantic government engineered bubble. And it therefore will collapse because China has no democracy, has no human rights, has no freedom of speech, no rule of law, no Western style legal system, no well functioning markets, no private banking sector, no protection of intellectual properties, no ability to innovate except copying and stealing Western technologies and business secrets. And not a host of many other things that the West has possessed for centuries, which have been viewed as essential for Western prosperity and technological dominance. And this is the one extreme view. So you have to have all those things. How can you continue your uh, economic uh, miracle without class? There's another polar view. The second view sees China's dramatic rise simply, simply as a destiny and returning to its historic position. Because of its great past, it was only a matter of time for China to reclaim its his, historical glory and dominate the world once again. So this, this, this view exists in there. As Laponian once said, China is a sleeping giant let her sleep, once she wakes up, she's going to shake the world. Why, she, why Laponia said that, we don't know. Maybe based on this view point out uh, here. But I think that neither view is, 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 is correct. They are based either on prejudice, based on some myth about European civilization, which I will talk more later, or some naive extrapolation of human history. Because you were great in the past, therefore you're doomed to be great again in the future. 
So first of all, how could a nation with all those adverse elements I pointed out earlier be able to grow at a double-digit rate for several decades and transform itself from a very poor agrarian society into a formidable manufacturing powerhouse? Secondly, if culture or ancient civilization is the explanation for China's rise today, then how come we don't see Egyptian, Greek, Roman, Ottoman empires bursting out of the world stage? And it's not yet. So therefore, it is a big puzzle. And also, let me talk a little bit more about the myth of the European civilization. Because Europeans have industrialized first, then they start to rewrite their history, try to dig things which they think make sense to make them number one. Why they become number one? So they dig a lot of things. Then, then ignore some other things. And through news media education, gradually we form a myth or misunderstanding of European civilization. I think uh, it is impossible to understand China's rise without it demystifying European civilization. So that, that's essentially my point. Okay, here, here's a, a Harvard University economic historian, Sven Beckert. He said, the first industrial nation, Great Britain, was hardly a liberal lean state with dependable but impartial institutions as it is open portrayed. Uh, portrayed. Instead, it was an imperial nation characterized by enormous military expenditures, a nearly constant state of war, a powerful and interventionist bureaucracy, high taxes, skyrocketing government debt, and protectionist tariffs. And it was certainly not democratic. Well, you, if you think that this Harvard economic historian is not famous enough, let me give you another quote. This is, I think, the, the most famous well-known economic historian. If there's another Nobel Prize awarded to a historian, he would be the, uh, the one, I think. So there's Joe Moore here at Northwestern University. He said that the British society provided little law and order to protect industrial properties and human rights around the Industrial Revolution. If we think of that, human rights and property rights was the base for UK to have Industrial Revolution, this is certainly not true. And it had a surprising quantity of, ro of robbers. Local rioting, either for economic or political grievances, was common. It had no professional police force comparable to that emerged after 1830. 1830 was the time when the British had already finished first industrial revolution and was just kick-starting the second industrial revolution. And the court system was unwieldy, expensive, and uncertain. Britain depended on the deterrent effect of the draconian, very severe penalties because it had no official mechanism of law enforcement. Prosecution was mostly private, carried out by private citizens, not by the court system. And the crime prevention was largely self-enforcing with more than 80%, 80% of all prosecutions carried out by the victims. Okay, so that's the picture of Britain during the Industrial Revolution. So therefore, we face a challenge. How to explain China's rise? And uh, economic uh, Stephen Chang, the, uh, he's uh, one of the local uh, 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 Hong Kong here, he wrote, I can easily write a thick book in a week to criticize China, because China has so many problems. However, the fact that China's miracle growth has been lasting for so long, despite so many hostile social and political conditions is truly amazing and unprecedented. China must therefore have done something so profoundly right. What is it? That is the real challenge. Okay. So therefore, I think every economist, including economists here in the Econ Department, and the political science must seriously answer this fundamental question and challenge raised by, by, by Stephen Chan. So here's my explanation and my perspective uh, uh, to explain this phenomenon. So if I want to use one sentence to give my explanation, that, that is that 
China has finally rediscovered the secret recipe of the original industrial revolution, which is started in UK about 250 years ago. The short answer, long answer is in my book, and I, I would say stay more. <laughs> but that may sound like a tautology. So there, but by saying that, I want to link China's rise to the industrial revolution. So therefore, it is impossible to understand China without understanding industrial revolution itself. And also, it is impossible to understand industrial revolution without demystifying uh, European civilization, which we all uh, learn from our textbooks. But first, question number one, what is the secret recipe? If there's a recipe around, everybody should just use it to borrow it and learn and copy it, and every, every country is industrialized. But unfortunately, despite tremendous effort by economic historians. They have not found the secret recipe. Now, how, can, how come Professor Yu and you, you found it? I will, I will tell you later. Okay, so here's a quote from one of the famous, uh, most famous economic historian, uh, Greg Clark. He said that explaining the Industrial Revolution is the ultimate elusive prize in economic history. It is a prize that has inspired generations of scholars to a lifetime of, so far, fruitless pursuit. So they have come empty handed. We don't know. So that's kind of strange. The university has paid economists and historians so much salary, and it's still cannot explain industrial revolution, which had took place 250 years ago. Also, question number two. If there is a secret recipe, how come China did not find it before and suddenly found it today? And how come so many other nations still not found it? They're still struggling with industrialization. So first of all, let's have a visual picture about the power of the industrial revolution. Okay, so this is the economic data compiled by historian Greg Clark I mentioned earlier about a global world average income for the past several thousand years. And you can see that before the Industrial Revolution, which took place around 1800, every nation, doesn't matter which monarchy you are under, or kind of culture or religion you have, roughly live in the so-called Malthusian uh, poverty trap. Even though the income level fluctuates around the history, but the very low, very low, until an important point, about 1800, something dramatic changed. This is what the economists call the Great Divergence. Okay. A few nations, their income levels start to rise and non-stop. And the rest of the world remain in the same poverty trap, including China, until economic reform. Okay, so that's the so therefore, because of that huge change in income and its consequence, the power it brought to nations, every nation wants to emulate the British Industrial Revolution. But only a few succeeded. Many of them failed, despite repeated uh, trial and error. So only a few nations succeeded to, em to em emulate the British Industrial Revolution. First group of nations was North and Western Europe, started around 1820 and finished around right after World War II. And the United States start uh, started around the same time and finished roughly around 1940 before the World War II. And also Japan is a miracle. It's the only Asian nation which accomplished industrialization even before World War II. Okay. But uh, because of the interruption, uh, Japan even did not manage to completely finish it and uh, continued after World War II and roughly around 1970, Japan was fully industrialized. And the Asian tigers. So now these economic textbooks talk about uh, successful nations to emulate industrialization without mentioning the old powers, renowned uh, colonialism, imperialism, it was Asian tigers. Okay, they took a much shorter time after World War II, about a half century, to enter the high income uh, club. Although I have to mention that not every Asian tiger has fully so called uh, uh, finished their phase of industrialization because, for example, Taiwan 
uh, in terms of per capita income is only about 60% uh, of US income, but they're they are high income country, okay? Uh, if I have the time, I can come back to talk about Taiwan, how can they continue finish their, their process so that their per income level reach the level of the US. But put all them together, it's less than 13% of world population. And the rest, probably like 7 billion people, are still struggling in poverty trap. So why only a few nations succeeded so far? There are lots of theories, but the most popular one today is the so-called institutional theory or new institutional theory. According to this theory, the answer or the secret recipe for industrialization is political institutions. That's the key. Okay? And they argue that there are essentially two types of political institutions. One is called inclusive, another one is called extractive. Okay, inclusive one normally features democracy. And based on this theory, because inclusive institutions can impose restrictions on the elite class, and therefore yield room for free market, free trade, private property rights, and rule of law to flourish. And with that, you can have incentive to accumulate wealth, and you can incentive to innovate, therefore you can grow, and you eventually become rich. On the other corner, you have um, extractive institutions represented, represented by a dictatorship. Under this kind of system, you have no freedom of choice, no private property rights, no rule of law. Therefore, people have no incentive to work hard, to accumulate capital and wealth, to innovate. Then that leads to poverty. Okay, so that's, that's, that's essentially the, the, the simplified picture of this theory. Therefore, the solution for ending poverty is simple, democracy. And that, because of that theory, the US foreign policy has been based on this theory to spread democracy across the world to solve poverty problem, especially after World War II. So that's very well intended, I would say. But however, in my view, this theory is wrong, therefore causing a lot of problems. It's difficult to square the facts. First of all, we see many, many democracies with pervasive economic stagnation and the continuous political turmoil, such as Afghanistan, Egypt, Iraq, Libya, Mongolia, Pakistan, Romania, uh, Tunisia, Ukraine, you name it. Well, you may say that the time is not long enough. If we give, not, uh, give them sufficient amount of time, maybe they will eventually flourish. I would argue no, okay. Secondly, we also, see extractive institutions that have been economically very strong. For example, uh, Germany, since the middle 19th century until World War II, was a very powerful and industrialized nation under extractive political institutions. And also Russia. Okay, remember, before Russia's collapse, Russia was, was fully industrialized, even though later on they have to reform. I will come back to this issue later. If we are already industrialized, why do we have to reform? The theory also can explain New Russia's dismal failure in climate reform under shock theory. They, adopt, they adopted this, this so-called Washington consensus, consensus by adopting democracy and uh, the so-called uh, marketization, privatization, liberalization, and deregulation for the collapse. And you can also, this theory also cannot explain Japan's rapid industrialization during the, the, the Meiji Restoration under essentially a military government. And it cannot explain South Korea's economic takeoff in the 1960s and 80s, also under a, a, a dictatorship. And it cannot explain Singapore's post-independence economic miracle. Singapore was not really uh, democratized until very recently. And also, you cannot even explain the phenomenon in many US cities. Though under the same umbrella of institutions, the same institution, same rule of law, same property rights, yet you see blocks of extreme poverty and blocks of extreme wealth. You see blocks of extreme violence, violent crime, and blocks of obedience to law. 
Also, you can, can explain Italy. We know that South Italy and North Italy are very different. They share the same political system, same institution, same rule of law, but South Italy was much poorer than North Italy. Okay. There are many other things I can, I, can, I can point out. So now let me come back to China. China's economic reform started in 1978 as a new wave of attempt at industrialization. But that's not the first attempt in Chinese history. Okay. We all know the first attempt started around uh, 1860 after China was defeated by, by Britain uh, after the Second Opium War. And uh, that effort or that attempt to last for half a century, repeated try and failure, and eventually led to almost nowhere. That's why that system or economic reform, young movement, and a bunch of other things could not resolve China's poverty issue. There was a revolution, broad revolution took place in 1911, Xinhai Revolution, that overthrew the monarchy and established a modern political system based on U.S. model, U.S. Constitution, U.S. government structure. The founding father, Sun Yat-sen, he was educated in the, uh, in, the, in the U.S. And that movement lasted for about uh, 40 years without fundamental breakthrough, has made some progress. And precisely because of the ultimate failure, there was another revolution took place and thus the communism regime. So communism took the power and said, you people cannot make China industrialized. It's my turn to try. And they tried, of course, they mimic a Soviet Union system, because that time, looks at the Soviet, Soviet Union model was very successful, can make a very poor nation industrialized in a very short period of time. So many nations tried to emulate that system. Okay, and then we know the result. About 30 years later, China was still living in the poverty trap, okay, despite some uh, progress. But uh, those progress was far from sufficient to kickstart our industrial revolution. So before I, before I say the fourth attempt, how come, why did China fail in previous attempts? Is it because of the lack of free market and private property rights? The answer is no. Nowadays, it is almost a universal consensus by economic historians that China and the Qing Dynasty had a better market system and private property protection than European than UK at the same time. Okay, this is almost a consensus. But then you can say, well, even though you have market system, you had a private property, but you, you're under monarchy. It's not democracy. You miss democracy, okay? China also tried a democracy. The Republic era inherited the market system and the private property rights from the Qing Dynasty, but also changed its political institutions by mimicking American system. And yet still, some progress has been made, but without success, not sufficient to kickstart the industrial revolution. So also, nowadays, because we pay so much attention about the poverty and the decimal failure of a communism regime, we tend to forget what was going on before the communism. Okay. So let me give you some historian's record about what's going on in real life in Qing Dynasty. A French missionary, uh, a priest, traveled through China for many, many years, and between uh, 1839 to 1851, essentially between, between the First Opium War and Second Opium War. He wrote, there can be found in no other country such disastrous poverty as in, the, as in China, the so-called celestial empire. Not a year passes in which a terrific number of persons do not perish in famine. Let a drought, a flood, or any accident whatever occur to injure the harvest in a single province that two-thirds of the population are immediately reduced to starvation. You see them forming up into numerous bands, perfect army of beggars, and proceeding together, men, women, and little children, 
to seek some little nourishment in the towns and villages. Many faint by the sideways, by, by the wayside, and, the, and, and die before they can reach the place where they had hoped for, for help. You see their bodies lying in the fields and by the roadside, and you pass without taking notice because it was so common everywhere. It happened so, uh, so often. Well, you see, that's because that's under an extractive uh, institution. That's during Qing Dynasty, you know, feudal society, very, very, uh, very uh, uh, cruel government. This is what happens after Xinhai Revolution. So the 1999 Xinhai Revolution did not change the China's miserable rural landscape and the dramatic market failures. Didn't change it, despite political reform, despite the revolution. A British economic historian visiting China in the late 1920s wrote, the position of the Chinese rural population is that of a man standing permanently up to the neck in water, so that even a ripple, just a slight uh, wave, is sufficient to drown him. In Sanxi province, for example, at the beginning of 1931, three million people had died of hunger in the last few years, and the misery had been such that 400,000 women and children had changed hands by sale. It was enslaved. Okay, okay, I need to rush through. And we have American sociologist William Hinton conducted a research in China, Sanxi province in the, late, in the 1940s, more than 20 years later, and 100 years after the First Opium War also write about the, the, the devastating realities of death and starvation during each year's annual spring hunger in, 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 in China when food reserves ran out. And of the slavery, loss of girls, landlord violence, usury, endemic mafia-style killing, massacre, secret societies, and other brutalities that characterize everyday Chinese life. Everyday Chinese life. So such is the situation facing China and many pre-industrial agrarian societies. It served as the socio-economic foundation for the rise of communism and the radical land reform led by the Communist Party. That's why Chairman Mao said only socialism can save China because capitalism market system has failed the liberal nations. So, China's third of, uh, let me just skip this. Uh, so what has China done differently the first time? Well, before I provide you the theory, let me just describe some pattern uh, so we can draw theory upon that. So this is a state-led marketization. Okay, I emphasize state-led, very important. It features many things. First of all, Maintain political stability at all costs. No more revolutions. More tired of revolutions. Doesn't help. And the bottom up reforms starting agriculture instead of the financial sector. Not in the cities, but in the rural area. Promote rural industries despite their primitive technologies. Use manufactured goods instead of natural resources to exchange for machineries. And enormous government support at every level, down to the village level, to support the business and the infrastructure build up. Dual track system with mixed ownership instead of wholesale privatization, unlike Russia. But some of them may be accidental, they may not may, may not be necessary key. We don't know. But later on we'll come up with theory. Okay. And the move of the industrial ladder from rural to urban industries, from light to heavy manufacturing, from labor to capital intensive production, from manufacture capitalism to financial capital. China today just started doing the financial reform. Okay. If you if you did 30 years ago, China would have failed. That's my theory. Okay. And a high saving state to a welfare state. So now let me give you the pattern of industrial revolution. Essentially I want to show you that those steps China took turns out by accident, because we don't have a theory, economies are useless. By accident, they mimic the historical sequence of the British Industrial Revolution, which is characterized by five stages. First stage, 
we call it proto-industrialization. It is a mercantilist state-promoted rural industries aiming at a long distance trade. Okay, even though they use very primitive technology, use cartridge industries, where produce simple stuff, sell to the remote market. That lasts for several hundred years in Europe. Then through that process, you pave the foundation for the first industrial revolution, which features labor intensive mass production for mass market. Then it created a huge demand for industrial trinity. Essentially, it's modern energy, such as coal or oil, locomotive power, such as a steam engine, infrastructure, such as a railroad, to facilitate the mass distribution. Then that automatically led to second industrial revolution, which features mass production of the means of mass production, intermediate goods, raw materials, infrastructure. You have to mass produce it. Okay. But that has to follow the first industrial revolution, because that provided the foundation for this wave of industrialization. After that, the society becomes so productive. You enter so-called welfare state. There are two aspects, economic welfare and political welfare. Economic welfare include, uh, features mostly social safety net provided for every worker, unemployment insurance, uh, for, uh, free Medicare, free education, uh, so on and so forth. And also there's a political welfare aspect. Even although uh, if the government does not provide it, people will fight for it. Okay. So including democracy, human rights, and uh, also a bunch of other things such as end of death penalty. So now let me quickly go through a soft sample of successful nations which has gone through those stages. Okay. Uh, uh, for the UK, for example, before the first industrial revolution, we do not teach uh, our students. UK had several generations more monarchies has gone through a couple hundred years of peaceful uh, time of proto-industrialization in rural areas. So this is so-called village township industry we observe in China was everywhere in UK in that period for several hundred years and organized and financed by rich merchants. Now, starting around the uh, middle 18th century, UK started first industrial revolution in textile, starting the textile industry, not in the stem, uh, not uh, uh, by stem engine, relying on, relying on wood frame and water power textile machines for mass production. And around uh, 1830, UK finished the wave of first industrial revolution, but that process continue, continues, but it's no longer the major uh, major industry now. Uh, kick start the, the industrial trinity boom, uh, energy, transportation, and locomotive. Now around the middle 19th century, UK entered the second industrial revolution, that means the mass production of the means of mass production. UK accumulated so much excess capacity, that's precisely the time UK started to change its ideology promote for free trade. Before, UK was, was not a supporter of free trade, okay, despite that Adam Smith wrote his book 100 years earlier. And around the, the 1900, UK finished second industrial revolution and entered a fully-fledged welfare state. Universal suffrage was not uh, taking place until 1928, so two, uh, many, many years after uh, industrialization. U.S. followed the same path. Before 1820, all the European uh, settlers uh, brought in with their technology of protein industrialization to the U.S. and cultivated the U.S. Uh, for a uh, couple hundred years. Then around 1820, U.S. started a, a massive uh, a rural industry, uh, uh, this is rural industry localization. And around the, uh, uh, so kickstart first industrial revolution around 1820, finished it roughly around the Civil War period. And at uh, that time, U.S. used technology mostly uh, stolen or copied from UK. So SP logic at that, at that time was very uh, widespread and popular. And around the 18th, uh, uh, 30 to 1870, U.S. started the Industrial Trinity boom. Around 1870 until 1940, U.S. started and finished Second Industrial Revolution. And the U.S. entered welfare state roughly around the uh, end of World War II. 
And at that time, you saw see lots of civil movements around. Civil movements took place uh, not without reason, okay? Uh, in the 60s, universal suffrage was uh, granted in 1965, and the Violence Against Women Act was signed into law in 1994. Same-sex marriage legalized in 2015, very, very late. Uh, Japan followed the same path because of time uh, I will just, just uh, pass through, okay? Normally, when we, when we uh, travel to Japan, we say, wow, Japan is so advanced. And uh, the misperception we got of the Japan started industrializing after World War II under democracy. No, Japan was already industrialized before World War II. That's why Japan was one of the big powers in the world and was able to start World War II, okay? And Japan passed the same uh, uh, same sequence. Otherwise, Japan would have failed to industrialize. So China, after the economic reform, by accident, followed the same sequence, but it condensed, compressed the whole process into three decades. Okay, in the first ten years, a reform was a booming per period for uh, for rural industries, and the number of village firms in that time increased by twelvefold. Village industrial growth output increased by 13 fold. That's unbelievable because uh, 300 years after UK Revolution, their GDP level only increased by that amount. Okay, and the village peasant workers increased to nearly 100 million, and the farmers' average wage income increased 12 fold, and the short economy eventually ended, which featured all the social planning economies, and the food, food security problems eventually solved. No more fam fam famines. Okay, that's the most uh, uh, important achievement in just 10 years. And the second phase, in late 80s to late 80s, I call first industrial revolution phase, that features mass production of labor-intensive light consumer goods, relying on imported machineries. And it became the world's largest producer and export of textile in 1995, six years before joining WTO. And also the world's largest uh, village firm workers continue to increase, reached 30% of China's entire rural labor force, not including the, the migrant workers. And the village industrial output grew by 28% per year for the past 20 years, doubling every three years. So by the late 1990s, China entered an important phase, which kick-started the second industrial revolution. The flagship industry in that time is Industrial Trinity massive build of highways and, uh, and uh, electri electricity uh, and a bunch of other things. It also started the, the, the so-called uh, uh, speed train system. So now about 2.6 million miles of public roads is built, including more than 70,000 miles of express highways. It's 50% more than the total length of the U.S. In the early, early 80s, everybody Chinese traveled to the U.S. You don't have to see anything else. Just observe the highway system, you, you would think China is hopeless. People that time, the government of the U.K. China took China 1,000 years to build the highway system the same length of the U.S., but only took China 10 years <clears throat> if we follow the right industrial policy or segments. So the list can go on and go up. China today has not finished the second industrial revolution yet. Is in the second phase of the second industrial revolution. So therefore, China now is comparable to the United States in 1920. That means China is still 100 years behind the U.S. despite all those dramatic changes. But however, with China's speed of growth, 100 years only means 20 years. Okay. So therefore, 20 years later, China will not only finish second industrial revolution, will also in a part with the U.S. in terms of leading the wave of third industrial revolution. That's a very powerful prediction based on this pattern. <coughs> so I will skip those, uh, those are my points because of the timing limit. And this is uh, China's success is not because what people think is purely laissez-faire and marketism. No. None of those succeed countries based on laissez-faire marketism. Well, market is certainly important because the market imposes economic incentives to compete and imposes a discipline on management and technology adoption. If you adopt the wrong technology, you will be a loser. It imposes Darwinian creative destruction to eliminate losers. So it's very ruthless, but you have to adopt it. 
but the answer is low for overlooked reasons. Economists do not know this because in our models we just have market. Market just automatically exists. No. It is extremely, first of all, the foundation of a market, we don't know, is social trust. Without social trust, no market can exist. It's, but it's extremely costly for independent and anarchic peasants to create organizations, to form corporations, unless social trust exists. And it's also extremely costly to create a mass market to support the division of labor and mass production. Without a mass market, you get a modern technology, massively produce goods, you have no place to sell. You have no place to deliver, you have no means to deliver. And it's also extremely costly to create market regulatory institutions to prevent cheating and fraud. Those forces will destroy the market itself. That's why you go to Africa despite the private poverty, there's no market. Okay, so those things are very important and are very expensive to create. And it is precisely the lack of state capacity and state-led market creation that destroyed Russia's economic reform, the opportunities. That trapped Africa and Latin America in their poor or middle income trap despite democracy and private property rights. It caused Qing Dynasty and the Republic of China's uh, failure because of lack of strong state capacity. So now the question is, if we want to have modern technology or to have industrialization, we must have mass production. You know, make, make, make everything cheap and available to everybody. But we need mass market. Where does mass market come from? How to create it? Well, early European powers relied on mercantilist government and a powerful military state to create a global market. Domestic markets are not big enough to support mass production. And through, of course, colonization, imperialism, and slave trade. Here's a quote from a Dutch merchant and a warrior, very, very famous. He was the CEO of a Dutch East Indian Company, okay, a state-owned, semi-state-owned company, which lasted for a couple hundred years, supporting British global ambition to create a global market. He told his monarch, your owners should know by experience that trade in Asia must be driven and maintained under the protection and favor of your owner's own weapons, military weapons, and that the weapons must be paid for by the profit from the trade. We cannot carry on trade without war, nor war without trade. So generations of British monarchies helped create for England the world's largest textile market and a global cotton supply chains. That's why British kick-started the industrial revolution. Not the Dutchies, not the Spaniards, not the Italians. So again, the same historian Sven Becker so without a powerful state that can project its power anywhere it wants, including trade, law, infrastructure, and military, the British industrialization was unthinkable. So British government was not a small government like the modern economists try to advocate. It was a powerful, bigger government, including the United States government. Okay. Thus, without exception, all Western powers who follow the British recipe of market creation supported by strong state have successfully emulated British Industrial Revolution, including France, Germany, America, and even Japan in Asia. However, after World War II, a new old order has formed. Today's developing country no longer have a lot of privilege. Just using your gunboat the, 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 uh, diplomacy running everywhere to open the door of colonies. You, you cannot do that anymore. Therefore, state and local government must do more, even more, to help to create a market by acting as public merchants. Okay. Because uh, through 300 years of uh, colonization, British age, uh, nurtured a big generation of merchants. They're, they're rich, powerful, and uh, very ruthless. Now you don't have that merchant class. Government have to act as public merchants. Hence, we see so-called Asian developmental state. The Asian model is really a state-led model. Okay. So, conclusion. Hopefully, I'm on time. 
So poverty is always an immutant, immutant freedom and space. Okay. Poverty is always an everywhere of social coordination failure problem. The problem arises because of the enormous cost of creating market and its fundamental pillar, social trust. You go to Africa, you have no social trust. How can you conduct an exchange? The free market is not free. It is a fundamental public good that is extremely costly to create. The ongoing industrial revolution in China has been driven not by technology adoption per se, but instead by continuous market creation led by a capable mercantilist government. A modern industrial market takes many stages to create. You cannot hope to create a modern market structure by one step. Therefore, you have to go through several segments. Since development is a sequential process of market creation, if you haven't learned the chemistry, when you synthesize the compound, you have to take the right sequence, otherwise you fail. That's why so many nations have failed despite repeated try. No matter how late a nation starts its development, it must repeat earlier stages to succeed, just like you learn mathematics. Thousands of years the human race has created this big knowledge of mathematics. Starting in 5,000 years ago, the primitive man counted, their, uh, counted number by fingers. Later on, they invented the uh, calculus. But today, you can teach calculus in high school, but you have, still have to start with counting your fingers. You cannot just jump to calculus, even though it takes a much shorter time. But if you do the wrong segments, you will fail. So in contrast, modern economy theories, including those institution theories, teach poor nations to leap forward. Everybody wants to leap forward. Politicians also want to leap forward, right? To start industrialization by either building advanced capital-intensive industries or by setting up modern financial systems in the very beginning or by uh, erecting modern political institutions. But such top-down approaches violate the historical sequence of the industrial revolution and the principle that a supply does not automatically create its own demand. Thank you. How many times do we have for Q&A? Okay, we have uh, five minutes for Q&A, so uh, if you want to ask questions, please raise your hand. Thanks, Dr. Wen. Uh, actually, fortunately, I read your working paper version of the book before. Okay. And actually, I have one question regarding the NST theory, the new state theory, because you mentioned the market creation due to the social trust, which is the underpillar of the whole system, is so important. But we have an assumption that is the strength of the state power is equal to social trust, at least in the early stage of industrial revolution, for example, the first stage or even the second stage. But the thing is, um, there is Chinese saying like shui ke zai ge, yi ke fu zhou. That means water flows the boat might also sink it. So, and also observing the populism emerging from the globally, yeah. do you think um, maybe in the next stage, according to the NSD theory, the social trust, trust m might not depend on the strength of the state power, but instead is, for example, transparency, democratic development, and a lot of other stuff. And also because NSD theory has the fact of a backward looking instead of forward looking, because nobody knows the future. So how do you? Can, how can you assume that the strength of the state power is equal to the social trust that we established? Okay. Uh, uh, very good question. Thank you. Okay, because I don't have time to go through so this. Is a, if I had time, I would have mentioned this uh, this uh, myself. So state power does not equal social trust. Yeah. Okay. But what I actually uh, made is, is this: in order to successfully industrialize. You have to follow the correct sequence. You cannot just start second industrial revolution or using second industrial uh, revolution technology, even given by free. You cannot achieve that. You will fail because uh, the, you have to build the 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 the, the, sub, the demand support. For example, how come the industrial trinity boom came? Was the enormous demand for energy and for mass transportation driven by the first industrial revolution? And also with uh, a nation, 90% of, of, of peasants scattered around the countryside. You cannot hopefully have this have a first industrial revolution and create some mass industry in the cities, because those people have to be, have to be the labor force. And if they produce that, where do they sell? 
So you start with this proto-integration process to, 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 to nurture the market. And you go through two stages. But now the question is, how come a less fair state does not automatically go through that stages? That's what I mentioned earlier. When you need to mobilize people, this is a social coordination problem. So therefore, you need a, a, a collective action. Collective action can either be done by government or by people <coughs> coming together. Right? But coming together is also very costly. So either way, if you can do that, it's fine. You need a, you need a, collect, a, a centralized process to, 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 to initiate that. Okay? But that said, also we also see dictatorship, which does not need anywhere to industrialization, like North Korea. So that's why, uh, I mean, I have mentioned enough. You, not only you need a strong state, but you need a strong mercantilist state. Mercantilism is hugely misunderstood, starting from Adam Smith. We just view that as trade, uh, protectionism. No, the fundamental spirit of mercantilism was to promote manufacturing and promote export. That's most important. Agrar uh, agrarian societies, they benefit nothing from, from, from mercantilism. If we all produce ma um, uh, agricultural goods, corn and potato, what do I gain by encouraging export? I want to exchange, I want to balance trade. Only when you start to develop manufacturing, because it's based on mass production, scale economies matter. You always have extra capacity. You need a bigger market size to absorb the fixed cost. So therefore, it has to be export oriented You have to create a larger, larger market. So that's the spirit of mercantilism. So therefore, a strong government with the goal of helping the economy through trade, through, mer uh, 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 through merchants, through manufacturing, then follow the right sequence, then I think uh, it's almost for sure you, you will succeed, because that's essentially all the successful nations will follow. But there are some state government, for example, Indian government, they did not uh, adopt communism. And after independence, even African government, nowadays we say, oh, government are you know, automatically crop. They just, uh, just uh, watch for their self-interest. This, uh, this, uh, uh, this is a misleading theory. A lot of uh, the, 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 the founding fathers, they are more altruistic than Washington. I don't think Washington was a, was a great altruistic man. I mean, he was a very selfish uh, merchant. But those many nation funding fathers, they had the ambition to help their nation to industrialize, even for people's benefit or for their own benefit to stay in power. But they adopted the wrong policy, wrong sequence, now you fail. Today, we still see ambitious developing countries want to adopt modern technology even without going through the proto-industrialization, without even kickstart the first industrialization. They want to have high-speed trains, like in China. If they do that, they're going to fail again. You don't want, because high speed train must be driven by demand. If there's no demand there, you build this expensive stuff, you cannot uh, finance it. Okay, so uh, that's just a short answer to your question. We can discuss more. Yeah. Uh, we can only take uh, one uh, question. Oh. Thank you very much, friends, for the provocative uh, presentation. One thing that uh, is quite interesting is to what degree is that uh, industrialization um, essentially a, a globally a zero-sum game. So uh, clearly the, ca the context of uh, Western industrialization, it was built on the back of uh, uh, both uh, exploiting uh, and extracting uh, quite a bit of uh, wealth through their colonies and also uh, getting global markets through their power projection. Uh, to what degree is it, is it the case uh, uh, now with uh, Chinese uh, with the Chinese rights, especially in the global context, like with the big uh, uh, trade uh, imbalances that are uh, uh, forming worldwide, that, that are creating some uh, some uh, protectionist backlashes, for example, in the U.S., like the recent election of Donald Trump. So, is there any way? to avoid uh, that kind of a zero-sum mentality as countries industrialize. Okay, uh, thank you for this very, very important and good question. First of all, by economic principle, doesn't matter what your motivation is to industrialize your, your, industrial your nation. 
even doesn't matter what the means you use. Like the old uh, European uh, empires, I mean, they use a very evil means. It's not a zero-sum game. game. Why? Because the nature of industrialization is to build uh, mass production technology, which by nature means tremendous reduction of, of prices and making goods available for lots of people. So even the colonized nation can benefit from that, even though sometimes unwillingly, sometimes unfairly. Right? For example, the British Empire, in order to penetrate its power, create a global market, they built railway system in India to transport, uh, transport cottons, to help them to, to ship uh, uh, opium to China. But that railway system itself could be neutral. If the Indian government, if they had a government at all, was able to wisely utilize it, that could become an advantage rather than disadvantage. But that really rely on India whether these sort of colonizers when they imported the technology into your country for their own self, uh, uh, selfish purpose, are you able to utilize that? It's your, 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 response, your, your, your problem. China during communism did a lot of stupid things, did not really utilize so-called American uh, imperialism to benefit China's industrialization until then. So after reform, China essentially bound to US power. OK, we, we follow your global order you created. But China also benefited a lot from a US created global order. So essentially, it's, it's the nation itself. How can you utilize this existing Western uh, order created by them, fundamentally under colonialism or imperialism, using their knowledge to help you to industrialize? Uh, that's really depend on you. But you can rely on your peasants to hopefully to, to, to utilize that because of the coordination failure problem. So it's not a zero sum game. Uh, okay, that's a short answer. Okay, because uh, uh, because of time constraints, so we have to end uh, this for talk. Um, let's thank uh, Professor uh, Wang Yi again for his uh, wonderful talk. Okay. So.